All right. Um, good morning. And um, sorry for the slight delay. Uh, it was unavoidable. Uh, OK, so we will uh, begin. Um, if we could have one person, please uh, lead us in prayer. And then we will begin the session. Um, any volunteers? If any one of us could just say a short prayer and commit the class into the Lord's hands, uh, we'll begin. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We humble ourselves in your presence. We pray that this time of learning would be beneficial for each one of us and help us to understand your word in its fullness. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, if you could just give me a moment to open up my notes. So uh, last class, we looked at chapters 8 and 9. And at the end of chapter 9, we saw that um, Jesus speaks about those who are blind. And um, he says, there are people who are willing to learn. And so even though they may be blind, even as knowledge is revealed to them, they are willing to learn from whatever has been revealed to them. And their blindness starts going away. But then there are those to whom the truth has been shown. And even though they see the truth, they choose not to see it. So even though they are not blind, they choose to be blind. Uh, and um, so in that category, you know, um, uh, are these Pharisees. And we also just very briefly touched upon the fact that uh, chapter 10, verse 1, is dealing with uh, such people. So immediately after talking about how some people choose to be blind, and uh, so they are guilty, they have seen the truth, they have seen the evidence. So technically, uh, they are no longer blind. They have seen it. But they choose to pretend that they are blind. And uh, regarding such people, Jesus says in chapter 10, verse 1, you are the, you know, um, uh, the shepherds, the leaders, who do not want to enter the sheep pen by the gate, but you are trying to climb in in some other way. And so he says, you are nothing but thieves and robbers. That's basically how chapter 10, verse 1 begins. Uh, so if we could have someone read out for us, uh, John chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 4, uh, we will look at the significance of what is being uh, conveyed over here by Jesus. So uh, if we could have one person read out for us, John chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 4, please. Yeah. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him for him they know his voice yeah so here jesus is using imagery which would have been very familiar to them in their times um they had two kinds of sheep enclosures uh the first kind is mentioned over here this would be a sheep pen uh, which is available in the you know uh, various towns and villages um there would be some common one or two enclosures where all the shepherds would uh, store their sheep. Uh, because I suppose it would have been more economical to have one general uh, sheep pen where everyone can you know, uh, keep their sheep rather than each person building his own structure uh, you know, to house his set of uh, you know, flocks. So um, here, it's referring to that kind of a sheep pen because it looks like this particular sheep pen has a gatekeeper. So uh, these sheep pens used to be very large enclosures with lots of stalls inside. And uh, so different shepherds would you know, keep their flocks in the different stalls. 
so uh, when the uh, shepherd arrives you know late in the evening or in the night with all of his sheep the gatekeeper allows them inside and so uh, he goes to his particular stall uh, the shepherd goes to his particular stall uh, leaves his sheep over there sees to it that they have uh, you know water and all of that and then he leaves uh, in the morning when he comes back the gatekeeper makes sure that it's not a robber or a thief who is entering but rather a trusted shepherd so the gatekeeper makes sure that only the right people go inside to collect their sheep on the next day uh, so if someone wants to come and steal the sheep he would not be able to enter the pen through the um, main gate uh, he would have to enter in through some other way and steal the flock so here jesus is saying you who choose to be blind even though you have seen the truth um, uh, you are like the thieves and the robbers yes you want to be leaders yes you want to be shepherds but um, you are not the rightful shepherds uh, because you know you have chosen to reject the truth so on the other hand if you had been true shepherds you would have been able to enter directly through the gate and the gatekeeper would have uh, allowed you inside uh, so a true shepherd once he comes through the gate he walks up to his stall he uh, it says he calls his own sheep by name he knows them all personally and then he leads them out uh, and then verse 4 it says when he has brought out all of his own he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him they are willing to follow him because they recognize his voice okay so the, he, so jesus starts off with this um, imagery and then he moves on to say certain things um we could uh, if we could have someone read out for us verses 5 to 10 uh, so from verse 5 up to verse 10 please yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him but they do not know the voice of strangers jesus used this illustration but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them then jesus said to them again most assuredly i say to you i am the door of the sheep all who ever be all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not hear them i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture the thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and to destroy i have come that they may they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly Amen. so jesus is contrasting himself with these pharisees and he says uh, you know what i'm not a thief or a robber like you the reason that you want to shepherd the flock the reason that you want to lead the flock is only to steal kill and destroy on the other other hand i am a true shepherd in what way am i, am I a true shepherd i am the gate and these sheep actually enter through me and they are saved now there are uh, two implications here uh, he is the gate in the sense uh, he is the entry through which the sheep go inside uh, he is also the one through whom they are able to approach the father so i mean if you're thinking about this imagery in spiritual terms um, not only is he providing entry um, you know into the enclosure he is also the way to the father so here in these verses you have the other kind of sheep enclosure being mentioned earlier we looked at an enclosure which you have in the towns a common one where you would have a gatekeeper who allows the true shepherds inside to collect their particular flocks here it's talking about an enclosure which would be out in the fields um, you know outside the town uh, out in the uh, open pasture lands uh, because some um, some shepherds would not bring back their flocks uh, back to the town every single night you know um, they would prefer to just camp out there uh, maybe for three days four days so when they are out in the open in that manner in case uh, the 
the the region where they are you know uh, shepherding their flock is a is a is a slightly risky area you know where they, where there could be wolves and other wild animals uh, in such a case in the night time they would try to find some kind of a shelter for their sheep so beforehand they would have you know chosen a cave um, or they would have constructed a, a mud structure you know just a temporary structure where they can keep the sheep during the night time so in case they have chosen a cave or a mud structure to you know um, keep their flock for the night there is no gate as such for that so the shepherd automatically becomes the gate he literally lies down in the entrance so if any wolf wants to go inside it would actually have to go through him you know so he's there to protect his flock so he, uh, in the first imagery jesus says uh, the gatekeeper will allow the true shepherd inside and over here there is no gatekeeper and no gate here the shepherd himself becomes the gate he is the one who is defending his flock you know shielding them from the danger of the wolves and so in verse 9 jesus says i am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved so uh, those who enter through jesus uh, they are uh, shielded from the evil one and they also uh, have are saved in the sense uh, it, it, people can approach the father only through jesus so in both of these senses uh, jesus is our gate so here jesus is addressing these words to the pharisees and he is saying i am willing to even be the gate for my sheep that is the way i you know save them uh, guard them you on the other hand are thieves and robbers all you want to do is to steal kill and destroy so he's exposing what they are he's exposing their uh, you know inner motives and intentions uh, because the pharisees were portraying themselves as very godly people who are upholding the righteousness of god uh, who who you know uh, care uh, for the people that is the way they have been portraying themselves but now jesus is exposing the inner motives of their heart and says you know you are nothing more than thieves and uh, so in that same uh, line he goes on to say the next few verses as well uh, so if we can have someone read out for us verses 11 to 13 I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Yeah. And I yeah so here we see uh, that if the person who has gone out with the flock is just a hireling even though he's supposed to be the gate which is you know shielding the sheep uh, and he he even though he's supposed to be lying there at the entry point of the cave or the mud structure uh, you know when the wolf comes along uh, if the hireling what does he do he just simply flees away he leaves those poor sheep which are inside the enclosure completely exposed and the wolf comes and attacks them and scatters them um, why does he do that because it says in verse 12 he does not own the sheep he does not feel responsible for them he has not purchased them on the other hand we have this good shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep and he has purchased them now of course they were you know the, the pharisees would not have understood the implications of what jesus is saying because the crucifixion event has not yet happened uh, but this is what jesus is saying he's contrasting himself with them and he's saying i am a good shepherd to the extent that i just that i don't just declare myself to be a gate i literally am a gate who is willing to fight for my sheep so i literally lay down my life for these sheep uh, whom i have purchased with my own blood uh, and so when the evil one comes i will not abandon them i mean these words are such a great assurance for us right um, because you know um, living in the fallen world that we are living in 
uh, we face attacks from many sides i mean simply because the world is evil uh, you know we we face injustices um, there are um, uncertainties regarding the future sometimes you know uh, sometimes there are struggles regarding finances regarding health all that just because you know we are living in this fallen world and then of course there are times when the evil one directly attacks us directly targets us so in the midst of all of this it's such a deep assurance to know that this uh, jesus what kind of a good shepherd is he he owns us he has purchased us he is not a hireling a uh, hireling is just there to watch out for his own interests the only reason that hireling is looking after the sheep is because he's going to get paid for it so he's basically in it for what he can get for himself so when he looks at the flock he looks at the flock as a source of income as a source of maybe gaining popularity or uh, you know um, uh, gaining some kind of material gain um, so the flock exists for the benefit of the hireling on the other hand the owner of the sheep he literally lives to serve his sheep so he sees himself as being there for the benefit of his sheep you know with the hireling it's the other way around the hireling looks at the sheep and says oh the sheep are there for my benefit but the owner says no i am there for the benefit of my sheep there's a you know complete um, uh, reversal in the way these two look at the flock so we are in the hands of someone uh, who cares about us personally and he has chosen to be our gate and uh, so we can have the assurance that whether people are attacking us or the evil one is attacking us he is there to watch over us so when you know um, unfortunate events are allowed and permitted by the lord we can continue to hold on to the fact that he is a good shepherd so he will never permit anything that have that i know that are not clearly within his eternal purposes uh, so we can always trust in his goodness um and then jesus goes on to make another point uh, which we would see in verses 14 15 and 16 uh, so yeah if we can have someone read out for us verses 14 15 and 16 please i am the good shepherd and i know my sheep and i am known by my own as the father knows me even so i know the father and i lay down my life for the sheep and the other sheep i uh, i have which are not of this world them also i must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd so jesus is continuing the imagery uh, and uh, you know he's already repeated this three times saying that my sheep know me they are able to hear me they are able to recognize that i am the true shepherd um, and um, in your pdf notes you know uh, pastor ashish has included an example over there um, he um, mentions a uh, an event that took place during world war 1 uh, when some turkish soldiers wanted to steal an entire flock of sheep and so uh, they come during the night um, they uh, you know and they begin to lead the sheep away and uh, the shepherd wakes up and realizes that his flock is being taken away and he calls out to them you know shepherds have their own unique signature calls um they have a particular sound which they make or they they you know they have a particular unique kind of whistle which they uh, you know um uh, uh, give uh, and the sheep are familiar with that so they know their shepherd they know the sound that he makes uh, they recognize his voice so uh, in this particular in incident uh, when he calls out to the sheep the sheep realize that they are following the wrong people and they immediately start flocking back to the shepherd and the uh, soldiers are unable to control such a large flock and you know the shepherd is able to get back his sheep so um, the sheep will never go with a stranger so here jesus is saying um, the, the the true sheep the ones who recognize my voice who recognize that what i am speaking is the truth that i am from the father they will come to me they will listen to me they will not listen to you pharisees because you pharisees are strangers you are not the true uh, you know shepherds uh, so here jesus is making the clear point that his sheep 
the ones who have uh, and you know and and a desire in their heart to know the truth uh, they will be able to discern the truth because god will help them the shepherd will help them to hear his voice and uh, so jesus goes on to say not only the sheep you know who are here in israel but even other sheep belonging to other nations they too will listen to my voice is what jesus says in verse 16 so he says i will bring them also and add them to my flock and he says there shall be one flock and one shepherd uh, so uh, we are all uh, part of one single flock so uh, originally uh, you know jesus did not mean us to have so many different denominations uh, we all were just meant to be one single united flock. Uh, but of course, you know, um, due to differences which cropped up, uh, people chose to um, form different denominations. But as long as we can, you know, coexist in peace, willing to help each other, willing to be there for each other, rather than pointing fingers at each other and trying to drag down each other, um, uh, I think it, it would be... Uh, all right uh, what usually happens between denominations is that each tries to declare themselves superior to the other and that is not something that pleases the shepherd at all because this shepherd he has laid down his life for the sheep i mean uh, the other denomination that i am criticizing and trying to slander he has purchased the sheep of that denomination you know with his own blood and so it would be a most evil thing for me to speak against them, to act against them, uh, to kind of blacken their name. Uh, no, these are things which the shepherd will not approve of at all. Uh, so uh, we need to be very careful in our attitude towards uh, people who belong to other denominations, who may have slightly other doctrines than we do. Uh, of course, when it comes to essential matters such as you know salvation, um, there is no compromising. I mean, um, we uh, follow whatever the scriptures say. Uh, but when it comes to um, other minor things about how a church service should be conducted, whether we should have uh, footwear or not when we go on to the pulpit and things like that, we need to be more flexible and we need to be careful not to criticize the others who are doing things differently from us. Uh, so, because these things matter to this shepherd who has purchased this sheep. Um, so, um, let's move now into uh, the next portion. Um, maybe we can look at verses 22 all the way up to verse 29. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. You know, such a wide variety of you are reading the scriptures today. We had so many different people reading so far. So thank you so much. Uh, if we can have one person read out uh, 22 all the way up to 29, please. Yeah. Verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Yeah. I father yeah. So here, you know, it reminds us, in fact, of Romans 8, where it says, who can separate us from the love of God? No, nothing. I mean, not even the principalities and powers uh, can separate us uh, from, the, uh, from the love of God. So uh, we have that echoed over here, you know, where Jesus says, uh, my father who has given, to, given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Uh, that is the deep security that we have, um, uh, you know, in our Lord. Uh, so we are the sheep 
who have chosen to listen to his voice and uh, you know, because we have been open to his voice you know we were he has helped us to accept him and now we are part of the flock the problem with these jews is that even though they have been hearing again and again and he's been saying the same thing you know um, to these people that he has said to his followers these people don't seem to be able to believe so here they are coming for the umpteenth time and again asking uh, you know tell us plainly who you are i mean hasn't jesus been doing that all along you know he said the father is testifying about me uh, you know the, the works which i do are testifying about me the old testament scriptures are testifying about me he has said this again and again and again and at the end of it all here they are coming again and saying tell us plainly you have not been plain enough and so jesus says the reason that it doesn't sound plain to you is because uh, you are not my sheep you do have no desire to hear the truth you when when you when, when, the, when the truth is presented to you you choose to blind yourself to it you know so so jesus says um um in verse 26 you do not believe because you are not my sheep uh, you know is what he says and and then uh, jesus again repeats you know one last time let them again hear it because they said plainly tell us so now in verse 30 he's plainly telling them he says i and the father are one and what is their response when he plainly tells them who he is they pick up stones to stone him now that clearly demonstrates to them that they are not interested in the plain truth you know i mean how how much more plain can it get the lord says i and the father are one and their response you know is not to bow down in worship but rather to pick up stones to stone him and so then jesus says i have shown you many good works from the father for which of these do you stone me you know, this is slight uh, uh, sarcasm in what jesus is saying you ask me to be plain so now i have been plain i'm telling you that i and the father are one believe in this if it was my true sheep they would have heard this and they have you know when when they heard it they believed it you on the other hand are unable to believe it because you are not my sheep and here you are getting ready to stone me so for which good work of mine are you stoning me now you know is what jesus uh, says over here um and uh, they are very angry and they respond and they say we are not stoning you for any good work they replied that will be in your verse 33 but for blasphemy because you a mere man claim to be god so now jesus is being very plain and telling them who he is and they do not wish to accept it um and uh, then we have uh, verses 34 up to 39 yeah if we can have someone read out for us verses 34 to 39 please John 10, uh, verses 34 to 39, if someone could read out, please. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blasphemy? Because I said, I am the Son of God, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought against to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So um, these are words that Jesus has been repeating again and again, you know. So um, uh, when they say we are stoning you for blasphemy, Again, Jesus says, uh, you know, if you don't believe uh, me, if you don't want to take my word for it, believe the works that I'm doing, because the works that I'm doing prove that I am from the Father. These are good works that I am doing. You know, so this is a, a repetition. Again and again, Jesus is repeating the truth. And, you know, like we um, kind of touched upon the idea in the, in the, in the previous classes, um, these things would have uh, meant a lot to the first time readers of the uh, gospel so um, this gospel was written out for to to build their faith to 
confirm and affirm to them that Jesus is truly the Messiah. So John was assuring his original readers that yes, even though you're going through persecution, hold on. Do not stop believing because these are all the things which Jesus said about himself and what he spoke is the truth. And you who are his sheep will be able to hear his voice and discern that what he is speaking is true. So um, uh, these, um, these, uh, these testimonies about his works, about what the Father has said, these are repeated in, in several places uh, because again and again, uh, John is, you know, stressing this, emphasizing this for his readers to assure them that what they have decided to do in following Jesus is indeed the right decision. And he's encouraging them to hold on to the truth uh, which is presented in Christ. Um, so here Jesus says something, uh, you know, uh, in verse 34. And uh, some people have come up with wrong doctrines. Um, um, based on these words. And so it is important for us to kind of understand the context. So um, when they say that uh, a mere man is claiming to be God, Jesus says, yes, you people who are familiar with the law, you know, uh, especially these Jewish leaders who would be very familiar with the Old Testament law, uh, he says, yeah, I mean, even humans have been called gods in the past, isn't it? In the Old Testament, doesn't it say in a particular place that People are also called gods, uh, and that actually is Psalm 82 that uh, Jesus is referring to, where actually it's talking about judges, okay, the, the judges who are supposed to dispense justice and protect the interests of the weak and the poor. Uh, so over there in Psalm 82, um, you know, um, God is speaking to these people who are uh, false judges, they are corrupt judges. And uh, so he says to them, you know, in, in Psalm 82, you are supposed to be the gods who are supposed to be defending the people. And you are gods in the sense the word of God is coming to you, you know, which is what Jesus also says over here. He says in verse 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came. Okay, so um, they were gods in the sense the word of God was given to them. And now they were supposed to uh, act upon it in the right way. So if God declared that someone is guilty, then they should actually punish them rather than take bribes from them and send them away. So uh, they were not doing that. In the same way, if the word of the Lord came to them saying that this person is innocent, release them, they are supposed to bring justice rather than exploiting the helpless people. So these people, uh, these judges in uh, Psalm 82 were not doing that. And so God says uh, to them, you seem to be under the impression that you're literally gods. You know, you're gods only in the sense that you are carrying out my word and you're supposed to be carrying out my justice. But you are under, under the impression that you're actually gods. But, you know, he says in Psalm 82, um, verse 7, he says, but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Uh, so, so Jesus says, even humans have been called gods by the Lord uh, in the sense that the word of God came to them. Now, here I am directly from the Father and I'm bringing words to you which are directly from him. And I'm in fact doing works which are from the Father to back up what I am saying. And still you are saying that I am blaspheming. You know, so, um, uh, so he... Um, brings an argument to them which would have made sense to them. These people who are, you know, standing on the Old Testament law, when they hear this argument, that would have made them think a bit, you know, about what Jesus is saying. Okay, so um, another maybe uh, passage that we could just briefly touch upon just to make this idea clearer, um, you know, in Exodus, Exodus chapter 4, verse 16, um, this is what. Uh, God says uh, to Moses regarding Aaron, um, he will speak to the people for you. You know, this is God saying that to Moses. So God is saying to Moses, Aaron will speak to the people for you. And it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. Now is the Lord saying over here, is Yahweh saying over here that Moses is God? Definitely not. 
uh, all that Yahweh is saying over here is that um, when you when you deliver my words to Aaron, it's as if you are God and you are giving to him what I am, you know, you're conveying to him whatever I have given to you. So in that sense, you are God. Okay, so uh, people who kind of twist this passage and say, oh, Jesus said that we are all gods and they start interpreting it in their own way. Uh, you know, they can lead us into all kinds of false teaching. So this is the correct interpretation. We are supposed to take this in this limited sense that when someone is conveyed, someone is conveying the words of God, in that sense, they are just a God with a minor G. All right. So I um, mean, not, not the capital G. Uh, so uh, we should only interpret this in that correct sense and not stretch out this concept. You know? So, um, yeah. Um, all right. Moving into the um, next chapter, uh, John chapter 11. Uh, so um, now this is the story of Lazarus. And we have a lot of details here, um, you know, that can prove very helpful. Um, if we can have someone read out for us, uh, John chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, please. John 11, 1 to 3. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Yeah. So uh, here we have... Um the story of Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And uh, John, the writer, clarifies and says, you know, the particular Mary that we are talking about here, uh, this is the one uh, who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, this incident, in fact, takes place later. I mean, you know, after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. So uh, at this particular point in the story, uh, this uh, you know, pouring of the perfume has not yet occurred, but she's the person, you know, about whom um, this story, uh, you know, um, talks about. Uh, so um, in verse 3, we learn that the sisters uh, are, um, you know, sending a message to Jesus saying, uh, Lord, the one you love is sick. Okay, so um, it looks like they uh, were hoping that, you know, he would immediately come and speak healing over. Uh, their brother and so they send a message and uh, we get to know at the end of the previous chapter John chapter 10 where Jesus is staying at this particular time uh, so in John 10 40 we are told uh, he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first and there he stayed so right now Jesus is staying in a place beyond the Jordan where John used to first baptize. So which is that place? If we were to go back to John chapter 1, verse 28, we are, we, we are told, you know, um, uh, these things were done in Bethbara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Uh, that would be in our NKJV. You know, NIV uses a different manuscript, so they have a slightly different wording over there. But basically, this seems to be some place which is beyond the Jordan which means that it's basically a one day journey. So um, it looks like uh, Lazarus is getting very sick. And so the sisters send messengers who would have traveled one entire day to reach the place where Jesus is staying. Okay, So they travel one entire day and they come over here with a message saying that yeah, the, the one that you love is uh, sick. And um, maybe we can read out verses 5 to 10. Yeah, if, if someone could please read out for us, verses 5 to 10. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. 
The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Yeah. Um, I seem to have missed out verse 4. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when the messengers come and they say that, Lord, the one you love is sick, uh, we have Jesus reply in verse 4. Sorry, I just missed out on that verse. Uh, so when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Uh, so the messengers have traveled one entire day and come over here, and now they're informing Jesus about this. And it looks like uh, Lazarus is still alive at this particular point of time uh, because Jesus you know, just simply says, this sickness will not end in death. Okay, So he asks them to convey this message. He asks them to take this message back to the sisters. Uh, so he is saying, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it so having given the messengers this assurance having told them to you know convey this this um, positive message to the sisters he decides to stay over there for another two days and with what attitude does he stay in um, you know in in that place for another two days with an attitude of love it says jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus so with that attitude of love and compassion he chooses to stay there another two days now later on in the passage we get to know that you know jesus finally goes uh four days after the burial uh, so we kind of get the impression from that that shortly after jesus has given his message to the messengers telling that this will not end in death it looks like maybe around that time lazarus dies so they would have traveled one day again, you know, when another entire day's travel, you know, they would have gone back. And so when they reach over there with this message, which says this will not end in death, they, the sisters, are mourning the death of their brother. So it almost sounds like as if Jesus made a mistake in the message which he has sent. But when we read verse 5, it says he has done all of this in love with an attitude of love. And um, with that attitude of love, he has chosen to stay another two days in that place. Uh, so um, Lazarus uh, died at some point the previous day. Uh, so he was dead that day. Uh, the next two days will be day two and day three of his uh, being dead. Uh, and then on day four is when Jesus says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And, you know, uh, at the end of chapter 10, we saw that they were very determined to stone him. So it's a little risky to be going back over there, which is why the disciples say it may not be a very good idea for us to go there uh, now. And Jesus again uh, you know, says this about daylight being there and how we need to work when there is daylight. You know, this is something that we talked about earlier. Uh, in John chapter 9, verses 3 to 5. Uh, so in John 9, 3 to 5, Jesus had said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. So here he is saying, um, anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. Uh, in, in John chapter 9, he said, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, when we add up what we read in John chapter 9 with what is mentioned over here, you know, we can just kind of summarize and say that uh, the time for Jesus' crucifixion has not yet come. His days on the earth are, you know, um, um, he still has many more days left scheduled for him. So while uh, it is still time for him to continue his work over here, he will continue to do it. So he says to the disciples over here, he says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? My 12 hours are not yet up. So don't worry, I'm, we are walking in the daytime now while my you know, time has not yet come. So we will not stumble. No, no, no need to worry. Everything will be fine. Uh, so 
the disciples are worried that you know uh, he may get attacked uh, but jesus is assuring them and saying no no we are still having our 12 hours of daylight you know and i am in this world as the light of the world so it's all right nothing bad will happen we can go you know over there um and um yeah i think we kind of um, reaching our break all right fine then we'll we'll come back at 10 o'clock and we'll uh, resume from verse 11 yeah thank you <laughs>